here standing by the no standing sign to tell you a couple of important things. Uh, we're gonna get real here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey learning to trade and why I was down here in New York for so long. So let's see, um, 12 years ago, no, 14 years ago today. 14 years ago today, I would have been at work on um, just off of Sixth Avenue uh, between Sixth and Broadway. And I was down here uh, all those years ago because at that time I had uh, a little bit of a, a passion that I was pursuing. And you know, the funny thing about being down uh, here in the city is that you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm from, I'm from Vermont. I, I grew up uh, in the Northeast. I grew up in New England being down in the city. You know, this wasn't really something that I sort of thought as I was uh, growing up necessarily that I'd end up living down in New York. But here's the thing. It was part of the path of finding my passion finding something that I could get really, really passionate about. So what I want to tell you guys is I think one of the most important things is finding something that you really love. And I, I, so when I was down here, I was pursuing something at the time that I really loved. And, you know, every day today when I'm uh, up at my house and I'm trading, that is part of me finding something that I'm really passionate about, which is trading in the market. So, you know, the interesting thing with trading for a lot of people is that day trading is a, uh, it's a means to an end. You know, you're, you're day trading not because you're necessarily super, super passionate about it, but because if you find success as a trader, it can enable you to spend more time doing the things you really love. So when I was down here 14 years ago, I was working at an architecture and design firm. And, uh, by, by the way, anyone uh, tuning in on the stream, on the, on the live chat, just let me know you can hear me okay. I, I don't know how great the audio is, um, but hopefully hopefully it's, it's okay. So when I was down here uh, so 14 years ago today, I would have been working in, uh, uh, down in Chelsea in the studio, and I was working at an architecture and design firm. And so when I was growing up, one of the things that I really enjoyed was uh, not really, not really like architecture, like building buildings or building skyscrapers, but I was really into uh, floor plans, which is a funny thing for someone to be into, but I was like obsessed with floor plans. And, you know, we would go to someone's house and that night I would be at home like drawing like a little floor plan of the house. and. My parents were always like, you know, they're like, what do you want for Christmas? I was like, graphing paper. Graphing paper, what do you want that for? It's for drawing my plans. And so, you know, going through high school and everything, my parents were like, you should, you, this kid's gonna become an architect. That's that's what his thing is. He really likes doing the, you know, the floor plans, the, the, those kind of drafting, drawing things. And so I was like, all right, you know, maybe that maybe that is gonna be my thing. And so when I uh, was going through college, I got an internship um, down here in the city. And, and this is one of those things where um, if, you, if, you know, if you think of something, like for me at the time, it was architecture. And I was like, if, if this is my thing, I need to immerse myself in this environment. I need to find someone who's doing what I want to do and I want to I want to work for him. So I got an internship working at a architecture and design firm, you know, down here in the city. And so I lived in the city and I was doing that. And that gave me during the years that I was working there, it gave me this really awesome experience which has ended up helping me a lot today. So the the guy that I worked for, he ran a small kind of like high-end um, interior architecture firm. And, and so the, the cool thing um, that he was doing, which was like totally right up my alley, is, you know, there would be clients that would buy a, you know, whatever uh, apartment in one of these big buildings. And 
they would they would come in and they'd be like, "Here's the floor plan. We want to, we, you know, we want to redo it." And so it was a gut renovation, but the floor plan, of course, has to stay stay the same because you're working within the confines of the the structure, and you've got the puzzle, which is you've got the you know the, the gas risers and you've got the electrical and you've got the the water you've got all these things that you can't move so you're working within the, this floor plan to sort of recreate it change the bedroom layout or whatever it is and so that was like exactly what i really had been <laughs> really into and so here's the thing if i hadn't worked for him i wouldn't have learned that the majority of that job isn't the fun part of the design it's client management. That was the majority of that work. It was it was managing clients. It was, you know, you had you have these clients that are, you know, they've spent a lot of money. They know they know what they want, and you know, you've got contractors who go behind fall behind schedule, and you have price high, things go up, prices move, you know, the unforeseen conditions, things like this, and. You have a contingency. It just becomes, this, if, at least in my experience, it was a lot of dealing with client expectations and a lot of client management. And and his job, the guy that I worked for, I mean, he was constantly out trying to find new clients. And the, the easiest part and the tiniest part of that project was really the, the initial design. You know, finding a design someone likes is kind of not that hard. And then it's it's everything else related to it. And so I, I was working down here and I realized in that experience that I realized a couple things. Number one, I immediately was like, I, want, I, I never want to have, I really don't want to have a boss. I want to become my own boss. I don't really like working for other people. And I would kind of already known that, you know, before I had come down here, but I, I, I put it in my head that I'm going to work for this guy and this is going to be training. I'm going to train myself of how to run a business just like his. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how he's finding clients. I'm gonna figure out, you know, what his, what the business sort of back end structure's like, what the consultants are, you know, sort of figure out the whole thing, gain enough experience working for him, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it myself. I'm gonna open my own business, and I'm gonna be the boss. Uh, and so that was sort of, that was the way I, um, sort of, I guess, compartmentalized or uh, sort of came to terms with the fact that I was going to have a boss for a while. I was like, it's okay. I don't mind having a boss for a while because this is training. And this is, he's someone that I look up to because he's built this business. And, you know, some of these projects, these were multi million dollar projects. And he had, he was working on a commission of 20%. So, you know, a $2 million project, his architecture, architecture design fee was 400 grand. And, you know, so, I mean, I was like, wow, this guy's making a ton of money. And this was something that I learned that was really interesting. So he ended up investing the money that he was making in this sort of side hustle, side project that he had, which was he wanted to create his own interior lighting um, furniture and, and, and rug like designs and so he was putting all this money into like the R&D of the electrical for the lighting and manufacturing and like all this stuff and trying to find people that might you know uh, be investors or like one of the big um, you know one of these big design firms that might go ahead and say like we want to we want to take you on we want you to we're gonna sell your your designs and none of that ended up happening for him. And in the meantime, what was what was happening in the global economy 14 years ago, 2007, 2008, the market was tanking. And so what ended up happening in the architecture design space was there was a little bit of a lag, you know, because we had started these projects. Uh, some of these projects, you know, these are 12, 18 month long projects. We'd started them a while ago. And so they were still running even though you know things were going kind of crazy with the economy, the, these projects were still going. People weren't just going to stop them in the middle of the project, so the projects are still running. And um, you know he was still spending money like crazy. And then what happened were new projects stopped coming in, and all of a sudden he went from having staffed up, I was ten, maybe twelve people in the office, to 
having to staff back down. And during the time that things were good, he wasn't making good decisions. Like he wasn't paying, he still had student loans. He had like 200 grand in student loans and he wasn't paying those. He had this, you know, all these big expenses, everything was leased. He wanted, and this is really interesting, he wanted people to see him as being successful because setting the impression that he was really, really successful was how he was gonna get more clients. And so everything was leased, everything was, you know, on credit, everything on credit cards. So he was living in this, you know, fancy apartment, it was beyond his means, and he dug himself into this hole. And what that ended up doing was it ended up costing him his ability to continue to run the business. And so I ended up moving back up to Vermont because I didn't like work. I, I didn't like working for him. And for me, it was like it was really only meant to be like a temporary thing. And I learned enough working for him that I was like, you know what? This isn't this isn't for me. The, the part about it that's not for me is that I don't want to be working for some other person. I don't think that I actually like um, the idea of, uh, you know, doing all this client management and all this stuff. So I was like, you know what? I think I'm actually all good. I think I'm, I think I'm going to figure out something different. And so I moved back to Vermont and that was, you know, 2008, 2009 when I moved back up there. And that was when I was really kind of struggling because I was like, what's my passion going to be? You know, what is my thing going to be? You know, I, I thought it was going to be architecture. I thought I was going to go down this path. But now, I don't know if I'm in love with it anymore. And so when I kind of realized that uh, that wasn't going to be my thing, I, I really had this period of feeling lost and feeling like I just don't know what I'm going to do instead. Right? So what I ended up doing, uh, thats that was kind of when I started getting into the trading stuff. I was like, you know what? I need to make some money while I figure my other stuff out. I need to just have some income coming through. So that's when I was like, you know what I'm going to do is I have this friend who had made some money trading penny stocks when I was when we were in high school, when we were like 17 years old. I was like, you know what I think I'm gonna do? I think I'm gonna try trading penny stocks, right? That's what I'm gonna do, that's gonna be my thing. And so, you know, I, I got into trading penny stocks because I had a small account, I didn't have a lot of money. And it wasn't, at that time, it wasn't like this was a passion. It wasn't like I was like, oh, you know, this is what I've always wanted to do. It was, it was really just, okay, can I make a little bit of money doing this? Because if I can make a little bit of money doing this, then, you know, I buy myself some more time to figure out what I really want to do. And one of the things I had done a lot when I was a bit younger, uh, I did it in high school, I did it in college, uh, before I came down to the city, and then I did it a little bit after is I was working in this uh, pottery studio, ceramic studio uh, up in Vermont. And I did it in New Hampshire also, and I was teaching ceramics classes. So I'm doing these ceramics classes and uh, I was teaching kids and, and adults and stuff like that. And you know, it, it was something that in, uh, I, that I had taken classes when I was really young. So I had gotten good enough to teach, you know, kids and, and adults and whatever. And I really enjoyed that. It was something that was a lot of fun for me. I was like, this feels good. I, I like teaching. It's not what I thought I was gonna be doing. It's definitely not the architecture stuff, but you know, that's all right. I'm, I'm liking it. So, so I was like, all right, I'm gonna, this is like my thing, I'm gonna do this. So when I was back up in Vermont, I got into the trading and again, it was just sort of like a way to pay some bills and buy myself a little bit of time. And what I was thinking about doing, I was thinking about, again, be my own boss. I was like, I'm gonna set up a, my own ceramic studio. I'm gonna set up my own ceramic studio and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna teach classes and I'm gonna do my own ceramics too and I'll sell it at farmer's markets and you know, things like that. Sell it in some art crafts stores, whatever. 
So that was kind of what I was thinking at that time. And then, you know, I got so sort of fixated on this puzzle of learning how to trade, trying to figure this out. Because the thing that was really interesting for me about learning how to trade was that I was so, I was so, uh, I just became so like fixated on it. I saw the potential. You know, I saw other people out there who were doing really well, making a lot of money. And I realized that this could be more than just something I was doing to pay the bills. You know, I realized that this actually could be, like if I get this, you know, and this is what I talk about sometimes, the hardest part is just kind of like turning the corner because, you know, when you're struggling, you might have a day where you make a thousand, then the next day you lose 1,500, then the next day you make 2,000, then you lose 1,000. So you're just like one step forward, one step back. At the end of each month, you're not making money. So you're just like, I'm not making progress. But once you start consistently, you know, making some money, and it, it can start small, it can be, you know, whatever. You start doing consistently 50 a day, and then maybe you get up to 100 a day, 200 a day. What's really the difference between 100 to 200 a day and 1,000 a day? That's when you start getting into share size, right? And that's when you realize how incredibly scalable this trading is. And again, it's, it's not to say that you're gonna necessarily go from uh, you know, 100 a day well, average to 1,000 a day overnight. It's, it takes a process of being able to scale up emotionally to be able to handle the ups and downs that come with that. You know, but, but having said that, once I started to see that potential, the possibility of trading became so much more than just you know, this being like kind of a means to an end. I started realizing that if I got good at this, this could be, this could be huge. And so I kept, and so it, what ended up happening, inadvertently, I stumbled on a passion. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting it when I first got into trading. There used to be a Blockbusters right on that corner. I wasn't expecting it, but I ended up going all in. And I wanted to make it happen, and I knew that if I was able to make it happen, it could be a real, you know, game changer for me. So I went all in, and I'm one of those people who, and you guys probably know this because I've said it a million times. I didn't turn the corner until I was, you know, basically at the bottom. I mean, I had, I'd had lost a lot of money I'd gotten myself super super frustrated I dug myself a really big hole and I was like all right this is I, I, I don't know if I'm gonna I don't know if I am gonna turn the corner and one of the things that I started doing I created that blog which many of you guys you know know about the day trade warrior blog I set up the blog and I started kind of you know chronicling what was working and what wasn't working. And I was just putting stuff out there. And here's the thing that's really interesting. I found a passion. And so every night, you know, from eight o'clock till 10, 11 o'clock at night, instead of sitting on my computer and looking at cars or watching Netflix or something like that, what was I doing? I was writing articles, writing, well, articles, writing blog posts or making YouTube videos about what it was like learning to trade. I was putting out all this content, all this content. And what ended up happening, which I wasn't expecting, is people were engaging with it. I was getting a ton of, um, ton of views on YouTube. I was getting a ton of views on uh, the website, my blog. And I realized that this was actually, a door was opening in front of me. And the door was, people want to learn. There's a lot of people who want to learn about trading. There's a lot of people who just like you are confused. They don't really know where to start. And this could be, this could be your chance to be a teacher, again, to teach. But to teach something um, definitely a little bit different than ceramics. You know, and um, to teach something where 
the stakes are high, and for a lot of people it might not happen. But for the one or two or three or four or five of you out there, like right now, five, five or six of you out there, they're gonna take this idea of learning how to trade the markets, of learning this puzzle. They're gonna take it and actually run with it and try to make this happen. That for you guys, this can be a life-changing moment. So trading, it ended up becoming this, this passion and I, I wasn't expecting it at all. But every single day, I've been so excited to wake up in the morning to try to solve this puzzle of how to trade the market better, how to trade it better, how to trade it better. And so every day when I get up early to trade, every afternoon or every evening when I'm reviewing metrics or I'm making YouTube videos, none of that feels like work. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that for some of you guys, trading really is just gonna still be a means to an end. This is gonna be something that you do to try to make a little bit of money so you can spend more time doing the thing that you love doing. So last year, for instance, uh, I traded an average of two hours a day. And you guys can see on my website, you can see how much I made last year, averaging two hours a day. And then the whole rest of my day, I could do whatever I wanted. If I wanted to teach classes, if I wanted to do some great content for YouTube, I could do that. And I did because I enjoyed doing it. But I had the whole rest of my day to focus on my passion, if I wanted to. If trading for me was only a means to an end, then in the morning I could just do my two hours and then the rest of the day I could do the thing that got me really, really excited. And I, I talk about this all the time because, you know, so many people spend all this time, you know, we, we see it on, on social media, so many people spend all this time talking about making a million dollars, making a million dollars. You're gonna be a millionaire, you're gonna be a millionaire. And you don't hear me talking about that. And you don't see me, I don't go take $100,000 out of the bank and then spread it all over the bed and take pictures of me with it. I don't go stand next to a Lamborghini and take pictures. The, the problem in this country is so many people, just like my boss, want to look successful. They want to look the part. They want to look successful, but they don't want to do the work that it takes to get there. And the work that it took to get to where I'm at as a trader, it was years. It, was, it didn't happen overnight. And that was partly because I didn't have someone that I could learn from, so I was trying to figure it all out myself. But there's a million different ways that you could trade the market. You could find your own strategy. You could spend you know, months or years or whatever you want trying to figure it out. And that's fine, there's different ways to do it. But you know, one of the things, like I'm not as popular as some of the guys out there that are telling you that you're gonna get rich overnight or are basically saying that with some of the things that they show you, you know, the, you know, the, the private jets or the, the boats and the girls and all, all this stuff. I mean, that stuff drives me nuts. And, and what drives me nuts is that, you know, sure enough, the people that post that kind of stuff, they've got, they've got a ton more followers on Instagram, you know? I don't have any followers on Instagram. No one cares about me on Instagram because I don't post anything exciting. I don't post anything interesting. The stuff that I post is, I mean, nobody cares about it. In terms of like, it's it's not it's not Kardashian, you know, it's not flashy. But some of you guys who are on our channel, especially on YouTube, you know, why do I do well on YouTube? Because people go on YouTube because they want to learn how to do something. They want to learn. They're willing to put in the time. And whether it's how to rewire an outlet, how to um, how to connect a dishwasher, I mean, whatever it is, people go on YouTube because they want to learn. And so I've done well on YouTube because you guys, you know, this is a group of people that for the most part, you guys are wanting to learn and you're willing to spend the time to learn something. I mean, no, it's not easy. And that's the thing that, and that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm probably not as popular as some of the other guys out there because I'm gonna tell you the truth. I'm gonna tell you right now that it's hard, but I'm also gonna tell you that you know, for me, it's been amazing. And I'm so grateful that I took the leap and tried to make this happen. Because, you know, a lot of people, they won't take the leap. And, you know, maybe they wouldn't, maybe it's for the best. Maybe they wouldn't have been successful. But, but they'll never know, right? Because they didn't take the leap. They didn't try. 
and I, you know, I'm, you do you do what you want. I'm not talking just about trading, but just in general, like taking taking the leap and actually trying to start your own business. Like if I had done that with the architecture stuff, every, you know, if you're not failing, I feel like you're not pushing yourself hard enough because you've got to be taking risks. You've got to be stepping outside your comfort zone, otherwise you're not going to grow. So with trading, you know, I, w I really wasn't afraid of failing when I got started. I, and to be honest, I didn't think I would fail, but I wasn't really afraid of failing because I thought that even if I wasn't super successful trading, that I would learn enough about the market in general that that would help me in other areas of my life. Right, so I was like, it, it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like just that I'll make a ton of money on trading. I, I can, I, I can, you know, learn about dividend investing, dividend income and stuff like that, learn how to choose better stocks, learn how to, you know, make a little bit of money that way and, and not have to hire a financial advisor for, you know, whatever they cost each year. But, you know, that's, the, the whole thing is like, if you find something that you love, you won't work a day in your life. And I, I think about this with my kids a lot because I, you know, when I grew up, you know, I grew up with parents who both worked, um, you know, like nine to five jobs, and they both worked at the hospital uh, in town. Um, it was a psychiatric hospital, so they both worked at that hospital. My mom worked at that hospital for like 40 years, and then she got laid off. So, you know, she put 40 years in with one at one place, getting her check, but you know, she got her she got her vacation time, she got her sick days, she got her benefits. You know, we were able to take... Oh, there's a little puppy dog. Hi. 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 Hello. Hello. Oh, she's so cute. She was able to take her, you know, vacations and, and we, you know, she didn't have the stress really of being a business owner, but I didn't grow up with parents who were like business owners. You know, I didn't grow up with, um, I didn't really grow up with that kind of in that kind of environment and so you know I think about with my kids you know what do I want to what do I want to be teaching them especially you know because they're gonna grow up you know I think with, with quite a bit more and they already are we're growing up quite a bit more than I had when I was growing up so you know how do you raise them to you know want to work hard and have work ethic when maybe they'll have more things than I have so I don't know but one of the things that I I tell my kids, which, you know, they're really young, but I'm like, I'm like, if you work hard, you know, if you find something you love, you won't work a day in your life. And I don't like to say that like you can do anything because, you know, I feel like my generation, people are like, you could do anything you want. You could be anything you want. And that sets you up for this huge amount of disappointment when you realize, no, you can't. You can't really do anything you want. You know, some people get, dealt a hand of cards that isn't going to give them that opportunity. But I think the real lesson there, I think the real thing is what you do with the opportunity you have. You know, what you do with the cards that you are given and that, you know, and this is what I say to the kids, if you work hard, if you work hard, you can do almost anything. So I, I, I always say, if you work hard, if you work hard, if you work hard, you can do almost anything. But you gotta be willing to work. And, um, you know, little doggy, little, little poodle. And if you're not willing to work, then no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get those things. That's just, you have to have that. And I, I try to instill that in them. And you know, they're young, so, it's, I got a lot of time, but it's something I, that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, you know, just in terms of like how to, and it's not just with them. It, it's with, it's with other people too. I mean, it's, it's even with you guys right here. It's, you know, some of you guys are in a nine to grind, some nine to five grind. Some of you guys are, some of you guys are still in school. Some of you guys are retired. Some of you guys make a ton less than me and some of you guys are and you're really happy you're happier maybe than i'll ever be some of you guys make a lot more than me and you're miserable so this whole thing of like you know 
once you make your million dollars, you'll be happy. I can tell you that, that that's not true. You know, when I made my first million, did I get happier? No. You know what I did after I had made a million bucks? I bought, um, I bought my kind of first like nice car. And did that make me happier? I mean, it made me happy for, you know, a little while. And I kind of thought, oh wow, you know, I've got, I, I've really kind of made it. I've got a nice car and that, that says something. I, I still have that car now. And you know, so now it's, it's old, uh, but you know, it's fine. But that feeling goes away and it, it, it'll go away real quick. So, you know, my kind of feeling is that what you really need is to find something that you are so excited about every morning. And for a lot of you guys who are into trading, like me, you guys are excited every morning because it's like a new crossword puzzle, you know, or a new, new Sudoku puzzle. It's so exciting. It's like, all right, this is my chance. And every day is an opportunity to try to do a little bit better, a little bit better. And you see, you know, that this is, this puzzle of, of the market, it's a game in a way, you know, and every, every day is your opportunity to do a little bit better. I used to play video games until I started to trade. And then I was like, why would I, why would I play video games when I could be studying trading? Trading became like, a, in a way, a video game for me because, you know, I do it every day and I'm always trying to get better. I'm, I feel like I'm trying to beat my, my, my own performance. I'm trying to do better and better and better. You know, but again, like in my, my experience, it's been, um, it's, be, it's turned into a passion. And, and for some of you guys, it may not be, you know, it may really just be like, this is the thing that I do to try to make some money so I could spend more time, you know, doing whatever it is that you really, really like. So, you know, I don't know, tell me, those of you guys tuned in, you know, what's the thing that gets you really fired up? You know, what's your, what's your passion? I mean, is it trading? Maybe it is. Or maybe it's something else. But if you find that thing, and you guys, I mean, we are so, so fortunate today because today, you know, in this like world with the internet and everything else, it feels like you could turn fishing. So Alex says fishing. I mean, you could turn that that thing that you really love, you can actually turn that into a business, right? How would you do that? You make a blog, start with a blog, you start writing articles about fishing, you make YouTube videos, you start doing reviews of fishing, uh, different kinds of tackle, different types of, types of fishing poles. You have affiliate links with Amazon or a couple other you know, big companies. And next thing you know, you realize you're making a little bit of money on, your, on this thing that you love. And then maybe you decide to take it a step further, you know, and you start traveling around to really cool fishing places to get really good content because you're getting paid by YouTube to do it. Or, or you decide to create a, you know, monthly membership that gives you, gives members uh, a bunch of content around the great places to go fishing or, you know, access to your sort of private, uh, you know, recommendations each month of whatever it is. I don't know, I'm just talking out loud, but this stuff and the ability to, to create a business online as a side hustle, like that, that was something I'm, well, I'm, and I feel so, so fortunate, you know, from the trading perspective, because that's something that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you just couldn't do. And we can do that now. So, you know, you got to find that thing that, you know, you really like. And if, you know, you're diversified and you could do a little trading in the morning, that's awesome. Or maybe you're doing some investing or whatever it is. It doesn't have to all be one thing. Well, tell me, Peter, what's, what do you think? It's not to say that it's not, you know, competitive out there. It is but it doesn't feel like hard work, right? 
doesn't feel like hard work when when you really enjoy it. Hey, Ben. Well, you know, and so, and I'm just reading the comments here. Thanks you guys for tuning in and thanks for hitting a thumbs up. So, I mean, the thing is like, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a long time with the trading stuff. So, you know, I'm not disagreeing that I make more money than most, you know, people who are just getting started, but that's not what it was like when I got started and I had to work really, really hard to get here. I had to be willing to spend so much time sitting in front of charts, studying the charts, trying to figure out what I was doing wrong, how to get better. I mean, that's what I was doing just constantly. I was trying to get better, trying to get better, trying to get better. And you know, this is something that I talk about a lot in the classes, but you gotta figure out what you're good at. And then that's what you really focus on. And so, you know, for me, and one of the things that, so on, um, what day is it? It's gonna be, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday next week, I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to do a kind of a, a workshop for our students. Um, but I'll, I'll put the link for uh, YouTube people. Also, I'm going to talk about um, how I learned how to start trading during that workshop. And I'm going to talk about what I would do differently if I was going to start over today. If I was going to start over today, day one trading, what I would do differently, because there are things I would do differently from the way that I learned how to do it. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll put something on YouTube about that. Um, I'll give you guys a link, a link for that. Um, it'll be Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon. But one of the things I talk about there is figuring out what you're good at and finding your strengths. And so like with the trading stuff, for me, one of the things that I was focusing on was looking at my metrics, constantly looking at those metrics and trying to figure out, you know, what I, what I was actually doing really well with, because, um, you know, it wasn't focusing, and some. this is what traders sometimes do, is they get into the habit of focusing on everything they're sucking at. Focusing on all the losses, focusing on how much they're losing. Then you're just staring down at the hole. You've got to focus on where you're doing well, and you've got to double down on that. You've got to be even more aggressive on that. And, you know, yeah, if you have an area that's really holding you back, it's not to say you, have, you should ignore it, but by just focusing only on your losers, You've got to focus on your winners and you've got to focus on what they have in common, what's working for them, and then, you know, get really aggressive on them. So yeah, so John says he's not good at swing trading. And you know, swing trading is hard. I mean, swing trading, you gotta be right about what the stock's gonna do over the next couple of days, so, or even longer. So yeah, swing trading to me is harder than day trading. And I don't feel comfortable taking the risk um, on swing trades, because I'm like, I, I don't have the confidence that something's not gonna happen overnight that's going to ruin the trade so i just say you know what i'm i'm just i'd rather just day trade just focus on that so yeah i i was you know as i was coming down here i was thinking about um you know living down in the city and thinking about how 14 years ago you know if i could walk by me of then you know what would i say You know, the thing is, it's like I was down here because at that time I was following something I was really passionate about and that I thought might legitimately work for me and be a career for me. And then I ended up, you know, I ended up changing my mind. And you know what? Sometimes people do that after years of college. They'll do four years of college, they'll do a PhD program, and then they realize, I don't like this. I changed my mind. Right. So, you know, I, I think that that's also part of being OK with. And I don't even want to say that's failing because that's not to me, that's not failing if you change your mind. But, you know, if you thought of it that way, I mean, that is what it is. But being OK with taking that risk, because if you're if you're never having, you know, setbacks, then, you know, my feeling is that you're just not taking enough risk. You know, you're just staying too much in your comfort zone. And that's, you know, that's that's in all areas. I mean, it can be on the business side. It can be on the, you know, the trading side. 
as a trader, you want to keep growing, you want to try to keep getting better, you want to try to keep improving, and that means pushing yourself. You've got to, you've got to push yourself to have those breakthroughs. If you just stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. You're not going to get better. But I get it when you're, you know, when you're trading and, and things aren't going well, you feel like, oh, I can't afford to take risk. So there's a whole process of being able to get comfortable enough that you can start to take a little bit more risk. So one of the things for a lot of beginner traders that I'm a big advocate of is trading, you know, a lot less. Just taking like one trade a day because so many beginner traders get into this habit of over trading, over trading. They get more and more aggressive and then they end up just, it's like capitulates and then snowballs. So you have to slow down focus on one, two trades a day, and then put that aside and then spend the rest of the day on your other side hustle. You know, that's the thing that I'm like just as passionate about. What I've been able to do with Warrior was was 100% because of that. I mean, it helped me because I was able to say, okay, I'm gonna put the trading stuff on the side for the rest of the day. Like, I'm not gonna trade my account. I'm gonna work on YouTube videos. I'm gonna work on blog posts. And so being able to kind of spread yourself out like that, and then you're not stuck with all your eggs in one basket. But, you know, I, I, I get that it's easy to say that, and the reality is, you know, you've got to be willing, you've got to be willing to work and to take that risk. And not everyone's going to, but having when I was down here, when I was living down here some, you know, 14 years ago, I didn't have a lot of money. And the job that I was working at, you know, interning, that didn't pay a lot of money. When I was living in Vermont, I didn't have a lot of money. So having kind of been at those two extremes of really not having a lot of money or just grinding in the middle, you know, grinding, working, eight hours, nine hours a day, just trying to kind of keep my head above water. That wasn't fun. That wasn't fun, especially when I didn't feel like I was doing that to kind of really get to the next level. When I just felt like I was just like clocking in, clocking out. When I was working at a gas station when I was in high school, right? That was, that was not fun. But like, and this is the thing that like, I get why it's so hard to hire people because why in the world would you want to work at a gas station? Uh, sorry, I think I just, my service cut for a second. So yeah, I was doing some work for this um, business class that I'm working on and I was, I found this uh, Matchbox car on eBay for, I think it was like $35 for a pack of 10. I saw that same car, just that one, selling on Etsy.com for 600 bucks. It was a, like a collectible Matchbox car. And, you know, if I was, you know, if I was in a position right now where I needed to hustle and try to make an extra couple hundred bucks, I wouldn't go get a job at a gas station. There are so many other ways that people can hustle. So, you know, that's the thing where I, I, I get why it's hard to hire people for those kind of jobs right now, because I, I, don't, I, I don't see why you'd, why you'd want to work that kind of job. I mean, if you, and, and even if I did, I would do it for as little time as possible, just long enough for me to buy a smartphone and save up enough money so I could start, you know, buying things and selling them on Craigslist or, Facebook Marketplace or eBay, because that's what I did when, you know, when I was trying to make some money for my trading account, you know, years ago. That was one of the ways that I made some money. It can happen. So I think it all comes back to feeling like you've got this thing that you're working towards and that's what gets you pushing yourself really hard and driven to take it to the next level. Because you, you have, because I think that's one of the things is that, you know, in this sort of world, so many people are, they have this vision of what they wanna be. They wanna be a successful business owner, but it's so vague, there's no, there's no path from here to there. So then, you know, just 
there's there's no there's no steps there's no logical steps that you could take and so no nothing happens and then it doesn't happen and then you just kind of keep with the nine to five grind you keep just you know buying a couple things that at the very short term make you feel good but then you know a month later or whatever it's it doesn't make you feel good anymore and you're just in that grind you're in that just in the middle this is such a such an awesome time for people that want to be able to branch out I want to turn that side hustle into a business and make a little bit of extra money and you know whether it's trading or not I mean there's just so many different ways you could do it today and that's exactly it is the freedom that's why I wanted to work for myself that's why I didn't want to ever have a boss again and I haven't I haven't had a boss so 14 years ago that was the last boss that I had when I was working down here so I've been able to do it and it started with a side hustle it started with you know yeah selling some stuff on Craigslist you know making making a little bit of money and then you know the trading I was like all right this is something that can you know help me pay some bills I could do a little bit of the trading stuff and then you know it's just it just kept going from there so while I'm while I'm on and before my battery uh, dies is there, is there anyone tuning in that wants to ask me any questions I'm gonna put the chat up here so I can see your questions um, what was my first uh, aha moment you know so it's a boss 429 is a 429 not a 428 um, but my, my first aha moment when it comes to trading you know that's a that's a good question I, I, it's hard to say because when one of the things that happened pretty early on you know was early success you know I mean any one of you right now if you take a trade I mean in theory you've got a 50% chance of it being a winner right so the first time you have a winner, you're like, oh my God, I've got this. This is easy. I just have to do this every day. And then the next day you come in, you lose money. And you're like, oh man, okay, that was, that was weird. Well, let's try it again. The next day you make money. Then the next day you lose money. You make money, you lose. And then after, you know, a year of that, you're like, huh, well, I'm down, you know, whatever amount of money. But I feel like I do know about trading because I've clearly made money. It's not like I just had, you know, a hundred red days in a row. Um, but yeah this is a little trickier than I thought it was so I think one of the big things for me and I've talked about this you know a million times but you know it's a sort of part of the my story of the, my, the learning curve that I had was um, it was August and I was uh, I was living up in Vermont and so you know it's the first week of the new the new month and I ended up taking like a four or five thousand dollar loss you know I got I got smoked and because of that my account was below the PDT level so I wasn't gonna be able to trade for well until I came up with five thousand dollars to sell to um, you know fund my account back up above 25k so I had a, a couple old cars um, one I had bought for 350 bucks uh, from a from a friend so I bought that car I put in a new battery I did some other stuff to it anyways I ended up selling it for 1800 bucks so made a little bit of money on that i had another car just kind of like that that i sold so scrapped together scraped together a little bit of money funded the account again and during the time that the account was offline because i couldn't trade what did i do i reviewed the metrics i went into the metrics and i was like what are you doing right i didn't focus on my losers i mean i knew i was losing money in general but i was like where am i making money what is working in my strategy and as i went through that and i tried to figure out what was actually working in my strategy that's when I realized that there was something in common with my winners. I was doing better on stocks with high relative volume. I was doing better on stocks that were gapping up. I was doing better on stocks that were up at least 10 or 15, 20%. And I was like, okay. The, and I was doing better on lower price stocks. It was the higher price stocks in the 15, 20, $30 price range that just were like getting me day after day. I mean, it was like, it was terrible. So, so that was part of, okay. I need to cut those out. I need to only focus on this and let's see what happens if I do that. And that was the beginning of my turning point because after that I had about six months of doing pretty well. I made some good money. 
I grew my account from $25,000 up to about $55,000. And then in one day, I lost thirty grand. And I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I'm back to, um, you know, back to square one here on this. But I wasn't back to square one because what I had just done over the last six months was proven that I could grow an account. And what did I do on the day where I lost money? I was trading a stock that was like $50 a share and um, had breaking news. It was not a good setup. And so, no, it's not, it shouldn't be, you know, surprised that I ended up losing money on it. It was, it was not a good setup. So once again, I was like, okay, I got a little complacent. Um, I, need to, I need to tighten this up. And I did, I tightened it up. And then I went for another six, eight months and I grew my account back up to 50, up to 75, up to 100,000. And that's when I was like, I've got it. So there, I'm not gonna say that there was like a day where I was like, I now have it. It was very much a progression because that's trading. It's two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. So you're making a little progress. And then it's four steps forward, two steps back four steps forward, two steps back. And then maybe you have one day where you take four steps back and you're like, oh, that sucked. And then you, re you regroup, you get dialed in, you focus on what's working. And then again, three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, four steps back, four steps forward, two steps back. You know, and you, and you start, you just start slowly making progress. It's like, it would be like your car is stuck in mud. And you're like, what was the aha moment when you knew you weren't stuck anymore? It was like, well, we were kind of going back and forth. We was like really kind of close there for a while. And then, then all of a sudden we were going, so I don't know. And we still weren't totally sure until we were really like out. So I don't know if that's a good, but you know, that's kind of, that's kind of what it, what it's like, um, I think, or what it was like for me. So, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. That was a, that was a good question. Hey Jack. Hey Ethan. Should I risk the same amount per trade? So that's a good question on risk management with trading. I, I would say I don't usually risk the same amount uh, on every single trade. There will be some trades where, you know, I am taking more risk because I think it's a really strong setup. However, I'm not going to risk 100000 on one trade and then $500 on the next trade. So, you know, your risk has to be somewhat proportional from trade to trade. So I think at the very least, you've got to do that. Um, let's see. So um, friends, family, supported or understood? So that's a great question. So how, how were my friends and family when I was learning how to trade? In a lot of ways, um, I was on my own. And I think that this is true for a lot of people that are trying to do something that is a little bit risky and trading is certainly one of them. I was trying to do this thing that, you know, my family, they were, they were very skeptical. And, and even still, you know, I have some family members who are like, it's just gambling. He's just, he's, he's a good gambler. I don't know what to say. This guy's a good gambler, but he's just gambling. And you know, that's, they can have their opinion. They can have that opinion. I, I it doesn't really make any difference to me. Um, you know, there are times where trading does feel like gambling because there's so much risk involved. Uh, but it, but it's obviously, and I know that you know, I know that it's more than it's certainly more than that. So they weren't super supportive, um, and I think that it came from a good place of being you know being being worried about uh, you know me lo losing and failing. But here's the thing that I didn't do a very good job of. I didn't do a really good job reassuring them that that wouldn't happen. And part of that was because at that point I was too young and I didn't know better and I traded with real money even though I shouldn't have. I lost real money and I didn't want to tell them because I did exactly what they told me I should, you know, would, would happen. So I kept it all inside. And so I think that they probably sensed that I was not being super straightforward about how things were going. And, you know, so I, I think I made it worse on myself. I think what I should have done is I should have said, and I should have approached the whole thing differently. And again, this is like, I'll get into this more on Tuesday when I talk about sort of what I would do differently, but I, I should have done it in a way where um, I was managing my risk in a, in a smarter uh, way where I wasn't putting so much money on the table. And this is one of the problems with the PDT rule because in those days, I just thought I need a $25,000 account. 
And when my father had, had died, when I was um, 20, 21, 22, it's right after my 22nd birthday, and he was 61, 15 years ago, when he died, uh, 100, he had $100,000 that was split, or 200,000 was split between me and my sister, and I got 100 and she got 100. But I, wouldn't get, I didn't get that until she turned 18. And so I, I used that money to set up my first trading account. And I felt incredibly guilty as I lost that money. I felt so guilty. I, I mean, it was like my mom was telling me, don't trade, don't day trade, you're gonna lose your money. Uh, you know, this, I mean, that's what people said in those days. They probably do still say it now. And then sure enough, I traded with this money, I lost it and I felt so terrible. So that, that was not a good situation. And you know, what, what it ended up doing was it created this relationship that I still have today with losing money, where I feel like the biggest um, you know, piece of dirt in the world. I just feel terrible about myself whenever I lose money. And it's, I, I can't, I, uh, it's just like still in me because that was sort of, you know, it's like my early trading experience trained me whenever I lost money to feel like I was letting down my dad and I was just a loser and a piece of garbage. And that's a really hard, that's a really hard thing not, you know, in your brain to unwire. And I got that real bad. Um, I still have it today, but you know, that's, that's part of the deal for me. So, but in any case, um, you know, my, I don't, I still even today, like I don't really talk to my family that much about my trading. I don't tell them when I have bad days. I don't want to get into it. I don't tell them when I have good days either because I don't really want to get into that either, you know, because it's like, well, yeah, I had a good day, but hey, let's not forget, they're not all like that, but I don't want to talk about the bad days. So I just don't talk about it that much, um, you know, and that's, I don't know that that's the, that's the best way, but you know, that's what I ended up, that's what ended up happening for me. So, you know, I think, I think if I had more confidence, I might have, um, been able to say, you know, I'm going to try this thing. And you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right that I'm going to lose. Uh, but maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm right that this thing's going to work. And I'm going to try it. Because you know what? I don't want to be, you know, 60 years old and live with regret. You know, my dad, he died at the age of 61. He didn't even get retired. I mean, he really didn't get like your true kind of retirement that most people would think you would have. So, you know, that's, and his dad died at 61 too. So, you know, I, I'm kind of like at 37, you know, I'm, I might be halfway through here. I mean, I don't know, but if I live past 61, I'm doing something that the last two generations weren't able to do. I'm trying to take good care of myself, but at the same time, I don't want to live, you know, and have something happen when I'm 61 years old or whatever, and be like, I didn't, man, I should have taken, I should have, I should have, why didn't I step up? Why didn't I take more risk? Why didn't I, why didn't I try to start my own business? Why didn't I try to, you know, really create something that I could, whatever, uh, you know, give to my kids? Why didn't I teach my kids how to trade? Why didn't I, you know, try to teach more people? And, you know, so that's the thing. I, I, I wasn't expecting to enjoy teaching as much as I do. You know, I'm sitting here, I have two hours to spare, you know, I didn't have to come on here and do YouTube. I do this because I love to do it. I love to be able to be connecting with you guys. I love to be able to see other people out there who are, you know, for many of you, you're exactly where I was, you know, 14 years ago when I was still working a nine to five job. Or maybe you're where I was 10 years ago when I was just starting to learn how to trade. Or maybe you are where I was, you know, four or five years ago when I was, things were starting to turn around for me or whatever, you know, it's like, I, I love being able to connect with you guys and there might be one or two of you out there that take this and you're like, you know what, today's the day, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this happen. I'm gonna start committing to it. I'm, I'm really gonna give it a try. So, you know, I'm not saying that's gonna work for everyone. And that's, a, like I said earlier, you know, one of the reasons that I'm not gonna be as popular as some of the other guys out there is because I'm gonna tell you the truth that this is hard and it's gonna test you. It's really hard emotionally. Losing money is not easy. I lose money all the time. I lost money today. Um, you know, I'm green on the week and green on the month, whatever, but you're going to lose money and you've got to be able to handle that. And that's not easy. So you've got to be able to keep your head on straight despite losses, despite setbacks and keep pushing, keep trying to do better. 
So, you know, the other guys out there, you know, just generally speaking, who say this is a guaranteed way that you're going to make X amount of money or you're going to be the next millionaire. I'm not talking about how many of you guys I think are going to be millionaires. You know what I mean? Like, first of all, I don't think that that's what's going to make you happy. Yeah, it's better having a million bucks than not having it. But more importantly is how you get it. And if you get it because you found a passion and you were able to put in 100% on that and you were able to really lean on your strengths and you found success coming out of that, then you're going to really love it. And you're going to have, the money's going to follow. I really, really believe it will. And I, I didn't think trading you know would become a passion but look some people have a passion for scrabble <laughs> some people have a passion for sudoku some people have a passion for rubik's cubes trading is a is a puzzle every single day it's a puzzle and i i love solving the puzzle and every single day when i'm trying to solve the puzzle i'm thinking to myself man i could have done better i'm going to try to do better tomorrow 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 i'm going to try to do better and i keep trying to do better tomorrow and i keep trying to share with you guys everything that i've learned so you guys can hopefully avoid some of the mistakes that i made but you know, I'm not gonna be, I'm not, my Instagram's not gonna have pictures of Lamborghinis. It's not gonna have, you know, pictures of me laying on a bed with, you know, whatever million dollars of cash or, or whatever it is. So I'm not, I'm not gonna be that guy. And I've never been that guy. I, you know, I've had people come to me and say, you would probably have so many more people that joined if you started you know, if you did that, why don't you go rent a uh, Ferrari and start taking pictures? You know, and I, I see people do it, but you know, the thing is, this is the problem. I, I can guarantee you that if I started doing that, you know, the type of people that would start joining the people who want to get rich quick without working hard. And you know what that would end up doing is it would, it would kill the good uh, testimonials that we have right now you know the good momentum that we have right now because we've had thousands of students who have come through the classes who well, the last time I checked we had like 2,200 testimonials and 92% uh, of them were uh, five-star you know I mean that's that doesn't happen by accident right that's because we're thoughtful about the type of people that are that we are wanting to attract so, you know, if I start putting out that type of content, maybe I'd attract more people. Maybe I would. Maybe I'd have a million subscribers on um, Instagram. Maybe I would finally cross over a million subscribers on YouTube, which has been like an epic struggle. Um, but I don't, know if, um, I don't know if I'd be bringing in the type of people that, that I'd actually want. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. Let's see, let me look at the comments. So, um, well, thanks for saying that, Laura. So, you know, I, I'm, I she said, to tell your father, he's very proud of you. You know, it's, it's, it's hard for me to, um, you know, take that in because cause I, I feel like he wouldn't get it, you know. He never used a computer. He didn't know how to use a computer. You know, he wouldn't have used a smartphone. Um, you know, 2007 wasn't that long ago. I mean, he certainly could have. There were a lot of people using computers in 2007. I was using computers, but he wasn't. He didn't want to. He was, he, that was not his thing. So I don't know that he would really get it. Um, but, but he and I were really close. So I would, I would have tried to help him understand. But it's, it's confusing, you know, I mean, and the whole the whole market, I mean, it's it's not just day trading, it's crypto, it's Bitcoin, it's NFTs, it's the amount of money that people can make is, it's crazy, it's crazy. It's, I think it's hard for old school people to understand someone who could make $20,000 pressing keys on their keyboard. Like that's real money, that's not, I mean, that's insane. So yeah, thanks for those tuning in. I hope you hit the thumbs up. Um, I, I will do, um, I'll give you guys a link to join. I'm gonna do a talk on Tuesday in the afternoon and I'll, I'll put a link down here if you guys wanna check that out. Um, I'll, I'm not gonna do put the link down today, but uh, I'll do it, I'll do it maybe over the weekend.
I've got to figure out how we'll get um, you guys, get the YouTube people um, into that. But just, just keep it in the back of your mind that I'll do something on Tuesday. But I'll put some stuff together for it. I, I, w I won't be walking around. I'll be, a, I'll be at my desk and I'll, um, I'll be talking about, you know, talking in a little bit more detail about how I learned and what I would do differently today. So maple syrup season is over. Uh, we had a good season. I got about maybe four, maybe five gallons. So it's about uh, to get one gallon of syrup with the trees that, that I have. Um, takes about 80 gallons of sap, 80 to 100 gallons of sap. So it's like 1%. I have the, the sugar, a good sugar maple, you could get 2%, but I don't seem to have I don't seem to get 2%. I seem to be more like 1, 1 1.5%. So it's about 500 gallons almost of sap that I had to boil down to get those four gallons of syrup. But yeah, season's over and it's nice and warm. It's almost 80 degrees here in New York today. So I came down to the city um, for the day and then I'll be back up, uh, I'll be back home tomorrow. But yeah, whenever I come down, I, you know, I, I'm, I think about the fact that, you know, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was living down here, I was driving back and forth all the time. I was, um, you know, I mean, this was where I lived. 18 degrees in Minnesota. Oh man, that is cold. Hey Ryan, thanks. How long was it between my aha moment and my good goodbye to the regular job? So <laughs> I quit the job in New York and then moved up to Vermont. I continued working for him for, might've been like two and two more years almost. Um, let's see, it's it about two, yeah, a year and a half, maybe two, almost two more years. Um, and I was freelancing for him, which was giving me a little bit of money. So that was good, um, but then you know, that dried up. And so I, I ended up, uh, I, I, was, I was done with that income before I started trading. So yeah, that, that got me, um, that got me for a while, but uh, then I had to do it on my own. Why do I think day trading is considered taboo by some? I've never really heard any, I've never heard someone say taboo, but um, I mean, I, I think the reason that it's, you know, frowned upon, if you want to, I don't even want to say frowned upon, but the reason that some people approach it with so much skepticism, I think is, is the fact that a lot of people lose money. And, you know, if you're, if you said you were going to become a professional poker player, I think people would be like, oh my God, do anything other than that. You know what I mean? Because so many people lose money and it feels like if you're a professional poker player, you know, couldn't you at any given time have one day that, you know, ruin, that you're done? And obviously if you know how to manage your risk, you wouldn't allow that to happen. Uh, you know, but the fact with trading is, is kind of similar that you could have, you can do really, 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 really well for years and years and years and years. And then one day, potentially, you can make a huge mistake. And that's, that is pretty scary. It is scary. So you've got, to, you've got to stay on your game for sure. And one of the things that's really important is you've got to draw money out of your account so you don't leave enough cash in your account to go rogue. Because you have to remember that you cannot always, um, you can't always <laughs> trust that in the heat of the moment you won't do something crazy. So, you know, taking money out of the market and then putting it into, you know, wherever you want. You could put it, you could reinvest it. You could, I mean, there's a million things that we talk about it in the classes, but, you know, I wouldn't leave too much in there because you know, you're just putting yourself at kind of a, a level of risk that you don't need, but you want enough to be able to trade. So, you know, for me, the minimum I would say at this point for me, for the way I trade, Let's see, um, probably 250,000. 
probably. I mean, I don't need, you know, sometimes people will say, Ross, you know, if you thought about, you should open a hedge fund or you should open a, you know, something like that. And the problem with that is, you know, if you gave me more money, I wouldn't be able to make more money. You know, I'm, I'm as a day trader, moving in and out of the markets. I mean, I can't move in and out with 2 million share positions. You know, you gave me $30 million to day trade with, what am I gonna do with that? You know, so now I could start, I mean, I just, I just don't think I'd be able to make a whole lot more as a day trader. I do think that there's a bit of a cap to how much day traders can make. So, you know, I don't think that's anything you guys have to worry about. I think that if you were able to make a little bit of money day trading, 50,000, 20,000, 10,000, maybe for you that would be enough. Depends on how much time you're going to commit to it. You know, for the people out there that make 75, 100 or more, you know, that's awesome. There's not a lot of people that scale it all the way up to making millions of dollars. Yeah, it's all right. I, I've got my, I, I can charge up my phone uh, when I'm off the, when I end the, the broadcast. No, I don't trade OTC stocks. I don't. I think the Lightspeed ex execution um, is good, and I do think it's worth the commission. And it's not just Lightspeed. I mean, I think any um, broker that gives you direct access is going to be faster than your, you know, E-Trade or TD Ameritrade's, but you could always try it and see if you like it. So, you know what, um, one of the things I was, that I just keep thinking about, um, you know, with this whole thing with, with trading and with finding that side hustle, because I feel like for so many people, trading becomes this, you know, early morning side hustle that, you know, especially for people that are on the West Coast, it's like, I'm gonna get up early, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up at 5.30 every morning. I'm gonna get up four, 5.30, whatever. I'm gonna trade and then I'm gonna go to my regular job. And, you know, East Coast people who rearrange their schedule so they can trade a little bit in the morning and then go to another job or whatever it is, it, it, it takes a willingness to work hard. And, you know, I, I, I feel like so many people, and this is, the, this is one of the problems with trading, so many people out there, <laughs> you know, with trading, they want to be really successful, but they don't want to do the hard work of learning a strategy. They don't want to spend the time practicing a simulator, proving that they have the profitability, checking their metrics. They just want to have the success today. And when you try to fast forward like that and skip the really critical steps that you need to take, you lose money. And that's why I think most people lose money. It's, I really think that it could be avoided if you approach this from the right perspective, the right state of mind. So I'm going to leave it at that with you guys. Approach it from the right state of mind. I'm going to put a link, um, I'll put a link up here in the corner um, maybe later this week with um, a link to a video you guys could check out for Tuesday's um, session, which I'll give you guys um, access to. I was going to do it for Warrior students, but um, I'll put a link up here later in the weekend that you guys can check out. But I'll mention it on um, Monday also. So I hope you guys have a great rest of the day, and I'll see you back here. Uh, I'll come on maybe over the weekend and let you guys know what the schedule is for next week. All right, see you guys later.